What is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity refers to the fact that your brain can change its structure and function over time. Neuroplasticity is also sometimes called brain plasticity or simply plasticity. But what this means is that you can change how your brain works, at least within certain constraints such as genetic proclivities and the fundamentals of neurophysiology. You can learn valuable skills and facts. You can even train your brain to be happier, less anxious, and more resilient in the face of adversity. All of this happens thanks to changes in the strength of connections among neurons, known as synapses. Your brain contains about 86 billion neurons, which are specialized biological cells that transmit, process, and receive information. Neurons can connect with hundreds of thousands of other neurons, and those connections can change over time. In this video, we'll primarily focus on larger scale aspects of neuroplasticity. So if you wanna learn about neurons, neurotransmission, or some of the molecular mechanisms behind plasticity, I recommend my videos about the neurotransmitter molecule glutamate. By the way, I'm Andrew, and this is Sense of Mind. If you wanna learn more about your brain, consider subscribing and signing up for our newsletter. All right, now back to neuroplasticity. So through the lens of neuroplasticity, how do you learn to do something complicated, like playing an instrument or skating on ice or typing on a keyboard? The answer is that synapses in brain areas concerned with movement, perception, and other relevant functions change in response to repeated practice. As the neuroscientist Stanislas Dehaene puts it in his 2020 book, How We Learn, this kind of repetition, quote, strengthens circuits that have worked well in the past. That enhances the probability that the same type of activity happens again. Synaptic plasticity enables vast neuronal tapestries, each composed of millions of neurons, to follow one another in a precise and reproducible order, end quote. This applies not only to motor skills, but to learning of all kinds. Reading, writing, and mathematics are all acquired through practice, which leads to similar brain changes. In fact, neuroplasticity partly accounts for all of the ways that we change throughout life, like developing or overcoming a mental illness, shifting our priorities, or changing how we interact with other people. But what are the limits of neuroplasticity? How much can we change our brains? One of the most important limitations is that our brains become less plastic, less flexible, and able to radically change as we age. In his 2020 book, Live Wired, Stanford neuroscientist David Eagleman notes that, quote, brains are most flexible at the beginning in a window of time known as the sensitive period. As this period passes, the neural geography becomes more difficult to change, end quote. The exact timing of that developmental course differs based on which area of the brain we're talking about. As Stanislas Dehaene, who we met earlier, notes, quote, sensory areas reach their peak plasticity around the age of one or two years old, while higher order regions, such as the prefrontal cortex, peak much later in childhood or even early adolescence. However, some amount of change is always possible. Remember, neuroplasticity is at work whenever you learn something new or develop a habit. It's just that the rate of change occurring in a child's brain is orders of magnitude higher than in an adult's. This may not be surprising, for example, if you've ever been astounded by how quickly and effortlessly a child learns a new language compared to an adult. This may also explain why, as we age, our worldviews seem to become increasingly set in stone. And it gives us reason to think carefully about what we teach older children and adolescents regarding the proper rules and norms of social life, which are represented partly in the highly plastic prefrontal cortex. Now, let's move on to neuroplasticity, habits, and dopamine. Just as we might find it difficult to change our worldviews, it's also difficult to change deeply ingrained habits, especially those we call addictions. Yet we also know from success stories that it is possible. People do manage to quit, and it's partly due to neuroplastic changes in the brain's dopamine system. Normally, that system releases dopamine in order to signal that whatever we just did was valuable and should be repeated in the future. But drugs like cocaine hijack the system, causing massive dumps of dopamine that signal to the brain to do more cocaine. Over time, this leads to neuroplastic changes and it drives people to keep using regardless of if they actually enjoy the high or not. Therefore, when people successfully and sustainably quit such drugs, they've re or re-rewired their brain circuitry, especially in the dopaminergic system. Now, what about changing innate proclivities with neuroplasticity? In other words, can you change aspects of yourself that are genetically encoded? 
The answer is yes, but only to a limited extent. To start with a relatively trivial example, does neuroplasticity allow you to change whether you're right or left-handed? In past generations, many people who were naturally left-handed have been forced to use their right hands instead, and they appear from the outside to be equivalent to natural righties. But looks can be deceiving. So as Stanislas de Haines explains in his book, the brain region that controls hand movement, the hand motor cortex, is distinct in natural left and right handers. When you force a left-hander to use only his right, this difference remains, but the area corresponding to the right hand takes up more space in the motor cortex than it would in a left-hander who primarily uses his left hand. Even though handedness appears to be a relatively trivial trait, it shows that there are limits to how much the brain can change in response to experience. Now, what about something less trivial than handedness? Can you rewire your brain to, for example, hear with your eyes or see with your ears? To address this question, I wanna talk about an experiment carried out on ferrets by MIT researcher Mirganka Sir. He wanted to know if the visual cortex, the part of the cerebral cortex devoted to processing vision, was intrinsically devoted to vision or if it processed visual information only because that was the type of information it received and it developed in response to receiving that information. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but specifically, if you could reroute the nerves going from the eyes to the visual cortex, such that they went from the eyes or the thalamus to the auditory cortex, would the auditory cortex develop to process visual information and allow the ferrets to still see? The answer appears to be yes, but with important caveats. First, this was done just after the animals were born, when their brains were still developing and therefore highly plastic. Second, while the rewired auditory cortex underwent, quote, considerable reorganization of neuronal connections in a way that supported the processing of visual information, Sir explained in a 2005 article that, quote, the connections retained vestiges of connections in normal auditory cortex and the orientation map remained somewhat poorer than in normal visual cortex. So in other words, these ferrets could see, but not as well as if they had normal brains. This brings us to a question of nature or nurture. Now this relates to a debate about neuroplasticity, which is concerned with the extent to which our brains are multi-purpose information processors. On one side, there are some who believe that the cerebral cortex is extremely plastic, and that the main reason that one region is differentiated from another is that they happen to have different inputs and outputs. On the other side are those who think that the cortex's differentiation is more hardwired and influenced by genetics to a much greater extent. You can see how this debate is kind of a more nuanced version of the old nature versus nurture question. I'm not gonna take a side in this, but the two books that I keep mentioning throughout this video are each great representatives of the two sides in the debate. So David Eagleman's Live Wired is more on the flexibility slash nurture side, arguing that the brain is defined more by its environmental inputs, whereas DeHane's how we learn is a bit more on the hardwired or nature side. However, neither are extremists and both argue that neuroplasticity is important throughout life. And I'll also say that they're both published the same year and both great books. It's just also important to remember that plasticity itself, the ability of neurons to change their connections with experience is part of our genetic endowment. So as with all nature versus nurture questions, the answer is that they are deeply intertwined and may be fundamentally inseparable. How neuroplasticity can transform your life. I wanna end this video by noting that we have covered only a tiny fraction of this incredibly interesting area of neuroscience. We've taken a 30,000 foot overview of how neuroplasticity works, what it can do, and some of the important controversies. What is important to remember is that your brain is not fixed as it is, but neither is it infinitely malleable. This should give us a measured dose of inspiration. If you experience depression or anxiety, even if it is a very severe case, remember that there's hope in the fact that your brain is an ever-changing biological entity whose function and indeed its physical structure can be altered by various therapeutic interventions. For example, it's now known that one of the mechanisms by which certain antidepressants called SSRIs function is by enhancing neuroplasticity. And that combined with talk therapy can allow a person to shape their brain to be happier, less anxious, and more resilient. Sometimes people just need one or the other, antidepressants or therapy. 
but research has shown that in combination, they tend to have a synergistic effect that's greater than either on its own. Lastly, in recent years, researchers have found in clinical trials with humans that psilocybin, the active ingredient in psychedelic mushrooms, seems to have a very strong neuroplasticity enhancing effect that helps to make it an effective antidepressant. Now, crucially, these tests are done with trained experts who guide participants through the mind-bendingly intense effects of this drug. And that is very different from taking shrooms at a party or something like that. Some of these studies have found that after just a few sessions, psilocybin can have a profoundly positive and lasting effect on depression. If you wanna know more about how all that works, check out my video on the function of serotonin. All right, that is it. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you got anything out of it, please give it a like and throw in a comment below. Also subscribe to this channel for more videos about how your brain works, as well as interviews with neuroscientists and psychologists. As always, this channel is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. This episode was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.